Hi everybody, welcome to the Fiction Earth podcast. I'm joined today by Shane Bears and Melissa Studdard, two authors and poets and teachers. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. So um, to begin with, I want to give you a both um, opportunity to introduce yourself. So let's start with Melissa. Melissa, tell us about your writing and your teaching. Oh, sure. I, uh, I'm a professor at a community college in Texas. It's called Lone Star College. And um, I love it. I um, teach creative writing and composition and literature. And uh, my writing is, I, I do several different genres. Um, I've done a young adult novel, a workbook that goes with that novel, a poetry collection, and a collection of interviews. And um, the novel came out a few years ago. It's um, an episodic fantasy novel about a little girl who kind of stumbles from one exotic place to another. And she, she goes to these places like there's a city underwater and an island where everything that grows is an instrument. And... Um, there's a garden labyrinth with a book of life inside of it and all this really interesting stuff. But um, it's set up as a series of challenges that she has to overcome. And um, I guess I probably shouldn't tell you what her purpose is because she really doesn't discover that until later in the journey. Mm -hmm. um, but then My Yehida is a companion book that goes with that and it's, it has a bunch of writing prompts that are related to the things that happen in the book. Um, and it's got mandalas that uh, you can color. Um, and then I Ate the Cosmos for Breakfast is a poetry collection. And um, it's kind of organized around the idea that God is a woman. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, not, not a goddess, but actual the God is a woman. And uh, it kind of follows the cycles of birth and life and uh, um, reproduction, death and rebirth. So, and I wrote my own epigraphs for that book. <laughs> Sounds uh, very philosophical, which is something that I wanted to ask you about a, a little later. You, you both right. seem to have quite deep f uh, f philosophy in, in your writing, but I'm going to tap on that um, in just a little bit. Uh, Shane Doyle, tell us about your writing and your teaching. Okay, well, um, it, it's kind of very similar to Melissa, actually. Um, I am the department chair for the English department at a community college, Blue Mountain Community College in Pendleton, Oregon. And I teach sort of everything the same way Melissa does. So composition, creative writing, literature. And I am the author of two full-length poetry collections, um, A Brief History of Time, and The Children's War, and other poems, and both of those are from Salt Publishing. And I do also write fiction, but I feel like I'm sort of a slower fiction writer, so I have a few presses interested in a short fiction collection, but I need to write maybe like three or four more stories to really have a good folding book mm -hmm. going. So you both seem to have um, quite deep ideas, um, and as I was saying, philosophies. I'm just wondering, where, where do you get inspiration from? Let's start with Melissa. Okay. Um, actually, you know, I did minor in philosophy in college. I majored in English and minored in philosophy, so I've always been very, very attracted to um, deep thinking about philosophical topics. But I also, um, in addition to that, I have to say I'm very attracted to myth and fantasy, met metaphysics, mysticism, all of that kind of stuff. And I, um, I'm not really, I would at some point like to write some realism, but that's not really where my interests go naturally. My inclinations are more towards the activation of the imagination. I love to make things up. You know, I was a kid with my head in the clouds, and now I think I'm an adult with my head in the clouds. So um, I, you know, I'm definitely um, inspired by um, art, movies, other writing. Um, I love to read children's books like A Wrinkle in Time, The Phantom Toll Booth, Alice in Wonderland. All of these things are uh, inspiring to me, not just for my children's fiction, but also for my poetry, because I love the fantastical. I love to, and I think it's interesting that you're asking about philosophy 
in conjunction with um, inspiration because I do feel that science fiction and fantasy and these kinds of writing and films allow us to explore philosophical ideas in a way that we might not be able to otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, like, I think Shane also loves Star Trek, and we both do. And, um, you know, one of the things that I always tell my students about sci-fi is that it defamiliarizes us from humanity in a way that we can look at ourselves and really see ourselves. So, like, if you have, you know, an alien... <laughs> that is looking at human behavior, um, it will allow us to see things that have been normalized to us mm -hmm. that maybe really aren't that normal, <laughs> if you really mm -hmm. think about it. So, so those are all great, great inspirational things for me. I actually read one of your um, poems earlier today. I believe it was inspired by a Thich Nhat, you know, Zen Buddhist uh, Thich Nhat Khan. Oh, yes, absolutely. And I definitely... Um, I'm very, very interested in spirituality and religion and comparative religion, um, particularly the mystical aspects. And I went through a phase when, I think it was about two years, all I read was nonfiction and um, a lot, a lot of Buddhism. I think I read everything that Thich Nhat Hanh had written at that point. And uh, that definitely infused my ideas and my writing um so yeah that poem is actually the title poem of the collection i eat the cosmos for breakfast mm -hmm. and um there was a if you haven't seen it there was a, a film made from that poem that's i think they just did a fabulous job with yeah i actually um i shared that on my my other site the daily meditation.com uh that that came out a few months ago didn't it it did it did and uh, Shindo, how about your inspiration? Where, where do you glean inspiration from? Um, well, I really agree a lot with, uh, with Melissa. I did my first master's at the University of Chicago, and it was a master of arts in the programs of humanities. So it was kind of like a build-your-own master's degree. And I chose to study 19th century British literature and philosophy. Hey, good um, taste. So I, I missed what you said. I say, I say good taste with reference to the oh. British there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, but I, I think that really um, sort of exactly what Melissa was saying with, um, with sci-fi removing us um, so that we can study ourselves. Um, Gothic does that, and especially, you know, like Gothic horror, like like Dracula or Frankenstein, you know, we all sort of are the monster in a sense or are in some way the other and trying to figure out how we fit. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that, that really informs my work. Um, you know, how do relationships work? How do people work? What is it that we're supposed to be doing here? Um, and then all of those sort of conflicts that, that you learn about as a college freshman, you know, like man versus nature, man versus man, you know, those, those sorts of things. Um, and I think it's really interesting that that theory that Michael Chabon has, that writers are obsessive compulsive people who are just writing <laughs> the same thing over and over to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that, that probably all of us have a little bit of that going on. I read one of your interviews, I believe it was an interview, uh, earlier today as well. You were saying that you feel very privileged that you're able to have a career in a field that you're deeply passionate about. And that you, when you write, you try to create poems that people who don't have that privilege would enjoy. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I'm from a little farm town of like 1,200 people, and um, when I was growing up, it was like a either farming or factory town, and then after NAFTA, all of the factories left, so it's very much like a rust belt kind of place. Um, so I really feel like a, a big part of who I am is, you know, from the Midwest and working class, and so I feel like it's really important to stay true to that. So you've just touched on it there, actually. Um, I wanted to ask what personal events have influenced both of your art, whether there's anything that, you know, from your childhood that really motivated you and inspired you to become poets. Uh, let's, let's start with Shane Dale. 
Um, I think really um, most writers are somehow weird kids who didn't fit in. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a childhood that I would say is very tumultuous. Um, I'm sure there are people who had more difficult childhoods. But for me, reading was really an escape. And so I think just that sense of wanting to reach out to people, but also wanting them to take wanting to take them somewhere they haven't been if they are trying to escape. And um, Melissa, uh, any personal events that have inspired your your own background in writing? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think if, I do agree with what Shangle said um, absolutely about childhood. And then um, going forward from that is having a child, having my daughter, um, in a lot of ways I think has been the biggest influence for me because when I, I first started writing, um, I was in, well, I, I always wrote a little bit off and on. It's been a real fits and starts sort of thing for me. But when um, I went to graduate school uh, and got an MFA for writing and I was starting to write poetry, I was married and I became pregnant during that time. And so, and then I got divorced shortly after. So I was a single mom for a very long time. And I really didn't write much because I was working a full time job and I just had all these responsibilities and just barely even had time to sleep, much less write. But then what happened was when my daughter started to get older, um, she started to love to read. It was like, she loves to read and write as much as I do. And then it became something that we could do together. So that first book, that children's book, or the young adult novel, I really wrote for her when she was a preteen. And in fact, at the beginning of the novel, there's a poem that the girl, the main character, recites, and that poem was actually written by my daughter. Um, what happened was we were out to dinner at a restaurant where they had um, paper tablecloths, and the kids would draw on the table. And uh, rather than drawing, my daughter had actually written this gorgeous little poem. And I was like, I have to take this with me. So I actually took the tablecloth with me and put it into the computer, the, the poem, and I was kind of thinking of what to do with it. And then when I started writing the book, it just, it plopped right in. But um, in addition to that, I mean, I've written poems about her and um, just been very inspired by her and by having a child. So you both mentioned um, difficult periods um, in your lives that really inspired you. And Shandell, with, um, you were saying that you, your, your childhood was quite tumultuous. So when you write, um, with that sort of background, are you writing for sort of self-release or do you have in your mind the idea that there are other people who are coming from similar backgrounds and perhaps you might help them via your writing? I think it's both of that. Um, I think that writers really process their own emotions and experiences while writing. Um, one of the things that I try to tell students um, is that the way that writing about trauma works is trauma is a response to your being not in control of the situation that has happened to you. And by writing, you're making yourself in control of it. You decide what happens, what's told, what's not told. Um, and so I think I both process through writing and then I'm trying to reach out. Um, because anytime people feel like they're not alone, they are connecting with a survivor of something and that you know gives them hope that they're going to be a survivor too that whatever they're in they will eventually get through it mm. and uh melissa how about you for, for the m reader the, are you aware of sort of trying to inspire them in a specific way or yes i think so i mean both in, in my poetry and in my fiction, I well, first of all, I do agree with everything that Shandell just said, and I don't have a lot to add to it, but I would say that um, I think that one of the things that writing can provide for us is a sense of human connection. And I think when I first started writing, uh, I think maybe I was actually trying to sanitize my writing a little bit. I was, I was trying to be really positive and upbeat. Mm -hmm. And over time, I started to actually realize that the, the darker stuff that I was sort of censoring for my own self 
uh, is stuff that, that we all need to um, feel connected to through each other and to understand, okay, it's okay that I've been through this, this other person has been through this. So like Shandell said, this person is okay now, I'll be okay too. Um, and I think that there is a, a that this is a really, really important thing that writing can provide. Mm. So, um, with you both having said that, I would imagine that you've had readers co- who come up to you and and say perhaps you know that they've shared the, a similar life experience to what you've written about and how that has helped them. If if you have many readers who you know share those sentiments about your writing helping them overcome their own personal challenges, do you want to go first, Shingle? Yeah, I wasn't sure which one of us should go first. Sorry, my bad. Um, I- <laughs> Oh, no, that's okay. I do have that happen a lot. Um, And also, uh, I've had a lot of work about illness, um, both poetry and fiction. And what's really touching to me is when somebody reads, um, especially a story about someone who has cancer and says, oh, this character was just like my daughter. You know, thank you for writing this. Um, because I'm never quite sure in some cases if I'm doing it right or if I'm doing it justice. And so I always feel better about the chances I take and the work that I do um, when it really connects with someone. Do you think that writing can be done? You, you, you said they done right. Do you, but to me, um, things like poetry, I, I don't know if there is a, a done right, is there? Well, I think in... In cases of handling a, you know, sensitive situation like, you know, illness or racism or war or, you know what I mean? There are definitely more right and less right ways to do that. Sure. So if somebody has, you know, been closer to that situation than I have, like if someone is actually a war survivor or something and they said, you know, the way you did this was perfect. You know, that's just a great affirmation that I'm not you know, going too far or going into sentimentality or, or right. something like that. Right. So about authentic- authenticity then really is the... Exactly. Yeah. Yes. And how about you, uh, Melissa, have you had many readers come up to you and, you know, say that your writing has um, helped them in one way or another? I have, and it's, it's an absolutely wonderful feeling and wonderful response to have because I think Secretly, that's what all writers want <laughs> at some level. And uh, I think probably one, there are a couple that have really stood out to me. One was a man who wrote to me and said that he had decided to give up cigarettes and alcohol so that he could have enough money to buy my book for other people because he thought it would help them. And I was like, oh, that's great. Um, and then there was another woman who um, wrote to me and said that my book, that her husband had cancer and that they had a young daughter together and that she didn't really know how to talk to her daughter about death, but that my book had given her a way to talk to her daughter about death and um, prepare her for what was going on with her father. So just to know that I was able to do that for someone just if that's the only thing that happened in my life that would be enough you know it's an amazing thing it must be profoundly moving to to experience that you know to have somebody say that your writing means that much to them it is it is I guess that's that's something I'll have to look forward to Absolutely. <laughs> um, so we've touched on the uh, the deeper stuff. Now time for a little bit of an interlude, as it were. Um, <laughs> time to get a little bit nerdy. I wanted to talk to you guys about any kind of movies or books. I don't know whether you play games at all, um, but any kind of entertainment that you've really been into recently. So uh, let's start with Shane Dell. Okay, um, well, recently, what I've been reading, I'm not sure how nerdy this is. Um, I'm reading the end, of Va- uh, the end of Vandalism by Tom Drury, and I discovered it when I was looking for um, fiction podcast stories on The New Yorker. And the characters, which is so quirky and small town, um, 
there's that like a middle-aged divorcee character whose mother wants her to start dating again and she sends her out to give venison to the neighbors and that's how she thinks she'll meet you know the next mr right and um so i'm just really enjoying the midwestern quirkiness of this book because it feels a lot like where i'm from mm-hmm. um and i'm trying to think of other things that i've been doing um Eva. my son's five now so i do a lot of things like watching dino trucks and rescue bots All right. <laughs> you know, that, that might show up in my work someday but i'm not sure right now what they're what they're doing in my head and melissa um how about you? What, what, what sort of movies, books, games, or other entertainment have you really been taking recently? Yeah, well, I think, um, I, well, first of all, I read a lot of poetry. Um, I just absolutely devour it. Um, and as far as TV goes, you know, I was kind of a, a funny kid and that I didn't really watch TV much as a child. I just read. So now all of a sudden I'm discovering TV and... <laughs> Right. Loving it. And so I'm always in, in some phase of watching or rewatching Doctor Who. Uh, and of course, of course, Torchwood, which I love. Um, and I am watching an old series that, that a lot of people have already seen that's new to me called True Blood, right. um, which is kind of a fun vampire kind of show. Um, Sense8, I don't know if you all have seen that. That's a, a wonderful sort of sci-fi contemporary show. Mm-hmm. And, um, but I, I just, I have to say I'm a complete Doctor Who and Torchwood buff. Those are my favorites. Which, uh, <laughs> which Doctor Who are we talking about? The original or the, the newer ones? Well, the newer ones. I have seen the original ones as well, but I have to say Christopher Eccleston, the Ninth Doctor, is my favorite. So, um, and I love Rose, his companion. Right, yeah. So, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think Shandell probably teaching at a community college has also um, the opportunity to go to writers' conferences and that sort of thing. In fact, I saw her recently in Los Angeles at AWP. And um, so my college pays for me to go to a conference every year. And not that long ago, I went prepared to make the case to my dean that Comic-Con was (laughs) actually a legitimate uh, (laughs) academic conference. But, you know, as soon as I went in, she and started to approach her with it. I didn't even have to argue the case. She was like, oh, sure, go. That sounds great. And, you know, they had a wonderful keynote speaker. But uh, I took my daughter with me, of course. And um, we were standing on the street corner outside of the convention. We looked over, and and John Barrowman was standing right there. And um, he plays the character of Jack Harkness. And just to give you an idea how much we like him, we have a cat named Jack Harkness. So (laughs) I I looked up, and my daughter was standing there talking to me. And right behind her was John Barrowman. I was just standing there trying to, you know, let her know and be cool at the same time. Like, look behind you, look behind you. So... Um, that was great. So when you guys watch TV and movies with you know such a such artistic minds there, do you think you you watch them in the in the same way that that sort of non artsy people watch them, or are you permanently aware of you know all, all the the screenplay going on and the the symbolism and <laughs> you know? Unfortunately, I have to say I am completely embedded in my analytical mind and uh, it's very difficult for me to watch something without analyzing it yeah. uh, which is it, in a lot of ways it's great in a lot of ways um, sometimes I wish I could let go of that and just you know sort of relax and enjoy it more and I think it's funny for people who watch these shows with me because I'm always sort of butting in and saying oh my gosh did you think about the fact that that could actually be a metaphor for immortality <laughs> <laughs> And how do they respond? Can, can you wait until after the show yeah. to tell me that? Yeah. <laughs> and how about you, Shane, though? Are you able to turn um, off your I... analytical mind? or? Never. No. Um, I'm even the person that will be like, oh, my goodness, did you see the reflection of such and such in that window? Or, you know, the light was in the shape of a cross. This is totally a metaphor for a Christ figure. Um, so I'm sure that I also am, you know, kind of annoying to watch things with. Although um, it's great when you watch with people who catch all of those and um, and discuss them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shandell, we should watch together. <laughs> we should. We should definitely do that. 
So, um, you, you both uh, are teachers, so you're, you're going to know an awful lot about the next question that I'm going to ask you, uh, which is, for our readers who, um, you know, aren't, aren't published poets, poets or, or authors, but who perhaps want to express their more creative side and want to tap into that, that creativity, uh, how, how do you uh, advise people to, um, you know, to tap into their creative potential? And let, let's start with, uh, let's start with Shendo. Um, I am a big fan of doing challenges. Like right now, it's National Poetry Month, mm -hmm. and Robert Lee Brewer has a blog at Writer's Digest called Poetic Asides, where you get a writing prompt each day for National Poetry Month. Um, and some of them will be like, you know, write an outsider poem or write a poem about what you see outside of your window. Um, and I think sometimes just having a little assignment um, really helps. So I'm a big fan of that or, um, you know, even just looking up assignments for writers, you know, online, like Googling it. Um, I do think also being willing to look at things that you know very well, but from a different point of view, like, you know, rewriting Little Red Riding Hood as the wolf or with the wolf as a hero or something like that. Um, so just playing, you know, being very childlike and, and open to experience. And are, are those things that you suggest to your, your actual students? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I actually have a very bizarre set of um, flashcards where I have like a story card is one color and then a situation card is the other color. And I have everything from like, you know, Snow White, The Wizard of Oz, Bible stories um, as the story card. And then the situation card might be like in a nursing home or with a flipped concept of good and evil and people just randomly have to draw and have to write whatever they draw. Mm -hmm. Then Melissa, did, is your uh, style of teaching uh, similar? How do you encourage people to get in touch with their creative side? Oh, absolutely. Um, I couldn't agree more about the prompts because I think a lot of people just have a hard time getting started or knowing what to write about um, and getting going. And I think that um, one thing that I've noticed about giving my students prompts is that no matter what the prompt is, they will end up writing about what concerns them anyway. Mm -hmm. So a prompt is kind of a, a, a sideways or interesting way of getting to the meat so you're not attacking it directly. So like for instance, if I tell my students to write a poem about an apple, um, you know, if someone is concerned about a relationship with a stepmother, then they might start writing about a fairy tale. Um, if someone is concerned with creation, then we're in the Garden of Eden. Or, you know, if someone is concerned with the environment, then, then we're in an orchard. Um, but so their mind goes where it wants to go, and the prompt is, is a way to get there. Um, I also encourage my students to keep dream journals, to do writing practices to write in their journals because I feel also uh, and I have observed that creativity is really our natural state um, when we're relaxed we feel creative it's when we get so worried about all the little things in life that we get kind of blocked with creativity so if you can you know, sort of write that stuff out in a journal, it sort of clears your mind so that you can then write the more creative stuff. And as well, it helps you identify the things that you're interested in um, and that you feel passionate about so that, that that stuff can come out in your writing later. Um, and one other thing that I always advise my students is to separate the inside their mind, sort of separate the idea of the muse and the critic, so that when they are writing, this speaks to what Shangel was saying about it, keeping it playful, that when you are writing, sort of tell your internal critic, hey, I'd like you to sort of step aside for a minute and I'll contact you later when I need you, because if you're worried about grammar and editing and things being proper and correct during the creative process, that sort of thought process is actually antithetical to creativity. So I think it's very important to separate those out to um, remain playful during the creative act and to not worry about whether or not things are correct or right 
is it to just know that you can deal with all of that in the revision process. Mm. I would have thought the your idea there of you know separating the the self critic from the uh, the more free flowing creative side was was helpful to you know pretty much everyone. I mean, who doesn't have a self critic, right? <laughs> Well, exactly, and it can be really a big setback if, if you listen to that critic. Um, it can keep you from doing all kinds of things, and, you know, there's always time to correct mistakes, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't do something and it never happens, then, then you haven't done it, and that's a loss. I love that, too, like the whole beginner's mind thing. Mm-hmm. So I, w I wasn't planning to ask you to th this question, but because we've been touching on it anyway, um, I wanted to ask you about spirituality, uh, as you were discussing in the beginning. Um, Melissa, I know that you were saying that you know Zen Buddhism uh, is very important to you. Um, how, how does that does, do those ideas manifest themselves in your writing, or that um, is is just how you live your your own life, or how, how does how do that does that spirituality feed into your your writing and your poetry? That's an excellent question, and I want to start by saying that I think most of the time, uh, I don't know if this is true all the time, but I think for most writers and most people that who we are and how we live our lives does become a part of the writing. So it's hard to sort of separate it out. And I wouldn't want to anyway. Um, there is a quote that I've said often by Stanley Kunitz where he says, in order to become the poet that you want to be, you should become the person who would write those poems. And so, but yes, absolutely. The Because Buddhism is not just a way of life, it's also uh, a very philosophical. Mm -hmm. Those ideas do are definitely incorporated in my writing. And I would like to say as well that, um, I think I might have touched on this a little bit at the beginning, but I'm actually interested in the mystical aspects of all religions. So I'm interested in the Kabbalah, I'm interested in mystical Christianity, I read Hildegard of Bingen and um, all kinds of mystics, uh, uh, and so, I uh, and you know, Islamic mysticism, Sufis, all of it interests me deeply, um, and it, it definitely appears in my writing. And I think it relates a little bit. It's it's the more intellectual side of what I was saying earlier about being attracted to fantasy mm -hmm. and myth, in the sense that this is more. Um, you know, about, the, um, I'm not sure exactly how to say it, because I don't want to say that these religions are fantasy or myth, but by saying that I'm attracted more to the mystical aspects than to the, like, sort of practical aspects, um, it's just, it, it appeals to me in the same sort of sense that sometimes I feel like, um, you know, what might happen after we die um, would be as interesting or more interesting to me sometimes than, than what happens right now while I'm alive. Mm. And that's sort of my um, very active imagination at work. Mm. And um, Shindo, um, on your spiritual side, I was reading uh, an interview with you um, earlier today uh, in which you were saying that you always encourage your students to... Um, sort of put the pens down for it for a bit and to um step outside and to get out into the world and to really appreciate i, th I think you were saying um that if if a poem mentions a book or, uh, sorry it mentions a flower or something like that then you would actually ask students to to, to go out and find that flower and, and know what it looks like so you're kind of getting into the you know being oneness with with the world and with nature as well there do, do you have a spiritual sort of aspect that's in your writing at all um, I think that it's it's definitely that. It's very tied to, like, earth, nature, and weather, and, you know, like, flora and fauna and things like that. Um, I'm really not a city person. Like, I remember when um, Red Room, like, the author site, had this contest, like, what's the best city to be a writer? I wrote this essay that the best city is not a city, mm -hmm. you know, like, it's... <laughs> or mountains or, you know, whatever your nature place is. 
Um, and so I think that's really important to me. And then although I'm not like religiously Jewish, um, you know, obviously I have a very Jewish name. I have a very Jewish background. Um, sort of that, that always questioning, um, part of Judaism, I think is always in my writing, Mm -hmm. you know, um, just all of those philosophical questions, like, you know, why do bad things happen to good people and why do good things happen to bad people? And is there a meaning and, you know, what are we meant to do? Um, and so I feel like being the best person you can be like in your writing and in your life and everything to me is very connected. And, um, I really think I'm, you know, the best person I can be both in writing and in my life when there is a connection to nature. Mm. Um, so I'm glad that I live somewhere where if I go on a walk or a run, I probably see more deer than I see people. Um, you know, not that I don't like people, but but I like the deer more. They seem a little, you know, like less ready to be in conflict with you. So I wanted to get you both to share a reading. If there's any of your writing in particular that you would like to share, be it a a poem or anything else. So we'll start with Shandel. Shandel, do you have a piece that you would like to, to read? Yeah. And actually I chose this piece because I'm trying to do a series of poems about circus people or sideshow people. And, um, what's interesting about this one to me is I am working with the cellist Jesse Amon, and he is composing music to go with these poems. So it's just sort of the latest little project I'm doing. Um, so here is one of the circus poems called self portrait as rosin back writer. The arch of my foot is perfectly shaped to withers, to flank. I can stand in arabesque at a canter, sweep my back leg through, back bend, walk over, and land astride. The hardest part is the smile, the unnatural strain on the face. It is the difficulty of beauty pageant smile during athletics. The Pasifino beneath me flows like water. His walk is molasses. I give him molasses mixed with oats each night. He is sweet as sorghum. The clop-clop of his hooves is my heartbeat. Please pray the circus never separates us. This is the ringmaster's threat when the seats are empty. A horse costs so much to feed, and the lions are hungry. This is why I cry into the illustrated man's indigo skin every night. Wow, that's beautiful. That was beautiful. (laughs) Thank you so much. And Melissa, is there a particular poem or or writing that you would like to share? Sure, I would love to. Um, I want to read a poem called In Another Dimension, We Are Making Love. And it's a poem from my collection, I Ate the Cosmos for Breakfast. And this particular poem is about that kind of feeling when you're in an argument with someone and you just want it to be over already. Someone who you're romantically involved with, obviously. So, um, In Another Dimension, We Are Making Love. What color is dreaming, you ask? I answer in the language of fleur-de-lis, paisley, and plaid. Then what is the sound of death, you ask? So I draw you a picture of dreaming. What is left to know but that I'm rewriting the formula for the air between us? Part nitrogen, part oxygen, the rest trace gases of love. Like you, I believe most in what I cannot see or hear. Anger, a wounded steam rising from the cauldron of your throat. Alchemy, the steam dissipates and you reach across the table for my hand. So, I note that it was already storming before we arrived here, though my only proof is an exhausted cloud passed out in the courtyard and a thunderbolt curled up beside it. I point out that in another dimension, this restaurant is a bedroom in which we are making love. Don't try to understand. Just paint the air human. Take off your clothes. Hand back your coat of arms. What you mistook for a person is really a country with a dark and sacred history and no scholars to explain away the confusion. Just burn the archives down. 
Everything we have to know, we learned from a picture of dreaming. Everything we need to remember can fit on a scrap of paper smaller than your hand. Wow, you guys are so talented. It's um, it's intimidating in a way, actually. <laughs> but that that was quite beautiful. Thank you very much for, uh, for both of thank you, you for sharing. Um, thank you. <clears throat> so we are about ready to wrap up this first podcast. Uh, to finish, I wanted to give you both an opportunity to let listeners and readers know where they can follow you and get involved with any events that you've got going on or anything like that. Um, so let's start with Shane Dor. Um, how, how can people follow along with you and get involved with what you've got going on at the moment? Okay, well, I do have a website. It is shanedelbeers.com. So that's S-H-A-I-N-D-E-L-B-E-E-R-S.com. And it does need to be updated, but um, it does have the links if you want to buy signed copies of my books. Um, you can also find them at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or if you would like to support your local independent bookstore, they can always order those for you. Um, I'm really active on Facebook. Just make sure that you're finding my author Facebook page and not my private page um, just because I'm maxed out there with the number of friends and on Twitter I am Shandle R um, so just my first name and then my middle initial um, so I would you know love to hear from people and um, anyone who loves poetry and creative writing I would totally consider a friend so I'd love to hear from you fantastic and Melissa how about you how do people follow you, your own uh, events and <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> so I just have to say that was so sweet, Shangle. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, you're welcome. Um, so my website is also it's my name, melissastutter.com, and the spelling for that is M E L I S S A S T U d d a r d dot com, and um, my books are available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble online as well and uh, I'd like to reiterate what Shangle said about supporting local local booksellers so anytime somebody wants to order something into a local bookstore brick and mortar store I totally encourage that um, as far as Twitter and Facebook go I am fairly active on those as well and you can easily to get to those from my website and uh, like Shandle I would consider anybody who loves poetry and uh, literature and the arts a friend so I'd love to hear from people as well great so thank you both uh, for your time and involvement on this podcast it's been great having you both here well thank you Paul it's been lovely to speak to both of you